Spring is here. It's time to start thinking about family fun in the outdoors. This is Chris Williams promoting my good friends at Plaza RV in Bondurant. I've now bought two travel trailers from this locally owned company in the past five years. It's completely changed my family's life. We love spending time in the outdoors, tailgating, and most of all, being together. Camping has been an awesome escape for us, and I would encourage you to think about it as well. Head over to their lot in Bondurant. They have motorhomes, travel trailers, truck trailers, fifth wheels, and more. Check them out today at plazarv.com. They're 100% locally owned. Tell them that Chris Williams sent you. Heartland Flags and Gifts presents Legends and Listeners with Scott Docterman and Chad Leistico. Fly them high and fly them proud. Find your flag at heartlandflags.com. Breaking down the Big Ten from the Channel Seed Studios, this is Iowa Everywhere. Hey, Hawkeye fans, Big Ten fans, and Iowans everywhere. Welcome to a second straight Friday edition of Legends and Listeners, coming to you live from the Channel Seed Studios here on the Iowa Everywhere Network. Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register here, joined by Scott Docterman of The Athletic. We are in episode number 35 together on this venture. And uh, the last time we were with you was the UConn-Iowa Women's Game Day to preview the Final Four. Obviously, that was a riveting uh, game, a riveting Final Four. Resulted in the Hawkeyes finishing the Caitlin Clark era with a second straight national runner-up finish. We will circle up, circle back to that later in the show. But one of the reasons we waited until Friday for this week's show was because we were busy with Hawkeye football coverage on Thursday. So yes, finally, Scott and I have some fresh insight into the 2024 Hawkeye football team. Been looking forward to diving into some spring football for a while, obviously preempted by the Caitlin Clark show. And finally, we've got some time uh, this morning to do that, Scott. Yeah, yeah football is upon us for another eight days. <laughs> you know, this has been an interesting week, Chad. I mean, we go from being in Cleveland and watching the end of an, an era, uh, an era that uh, was among the greatest of any sport of any sporting athlete we've ever seen uh, to now we're back to kind of normal a little bit with, with football, but there's nothing normal with Iowa football right now. I mean, based on what we've, we talked to the players yesterday uh, and on Tuesday that there's a lot of changes going on and, and that's really fascinating, Chad. And uh, I guess uh, what were your first impressions from talking to uh, some of the offensive players yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. I noted in my column that this was the first time we'd heard from offensive players on the Iowa football team since before the Citrus Bowl. If you remember, Scott, the post-game player interviews were Joe Evans, Jay Higgins, Nick Jackson, and Torrey Taylor. No offensive players. So we hadn't talked to anybody since that 35-0 loss on, on the offensive side of the ball. And... We hadn't talked to anybody since the Tim Lester era began, since the John Budmeyer era began at wide receivers coach. It's been four months, or right? Three months, three plus months. And um, so it was good to talk to some guys. It was a lot of fresh faces. I know you. I did not make it to the defensive players on Tuesday. I was trying to take one day off this week, and I did. Uh, but really, I think everyone cares about the offense right now. And my first impressions were um, kind of like – you know, spring is never going to be pessimistic. Like, oh, we hate Tim Lester, whatever. But <laughs> like, but it was just, it just felt like there was a page turned. And it honestly, like, it didn't feel like people were like wound up about how the Brian era ended. They were like pretty genuinely excited about kind of the excitement and the fun and the, you know, the Tim Lester era and, and the John Budmeyer era too, to that sense. So I just, uh, I got... I know we're all going to pump the brakes on this, but we can't like tell you guys what they said and then be snapped at 
to say, well, they're not, you know, they're just going to suck again because Deacon's quarterback right now. Yeah, I mean, like, if you want us to tell you what we're hearing, great. Keep listening. If you just want to not know, turn us off. But I enjoyed hearing from them and, and relaying what we heard, Scott. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a certain group of fans, uh, you know, of this fan base that like to like to complain. And that's their goal in life. And that's what the only thing that makes them happy. And so the women's basketball team didn't give them a chance to complain at all. And the men's our season was already over with. So now let's complain about this. No, honestly, you know, here's here's kind of what I heard and what I liked is that, yes, they have turned the page. There is change. Change is good. Change is better. Um, they seem energized by it. Does it mean that they're going to get one more first down per game and one more touchdown per game? Well, you kind of hope so, but you don't know. So I'm not going to go into that part of it. But what we, were, what we are going to talk about, Chad, and what I think makes the most sense is how have they changed? And how does this make Iowa's offense better? I'm, I'm always the one, I, I kind of like offensive line play because I think that tells you a lot about a team and how they perform. And the offensive linemen I spoke with I'm, I'm like, have their fundamentals changed? No, not one bit. And that makes sense. Um, but what has changed is the verbiage around these plays. And for them, they're not doing anything too differently. But the way Tim Lester is coaching everybody around the offensive line is so much more, is so much different that it allows the offensive line to work better because Kirk has complained. We understand that they basically legislated cut, cut blocks out of football you know, because you can't do it so much off the backside and uh, unless you are perfect and they, and they don't even see it, probably you're not going to get, you're going to get, you know, otherwise you're going to get called for it. Well, in this case, they're not because a lot of the motions and a lot of the movement and pre-snap holds the second level tight to where they can reach the second level without them free flowing to the football and destroying their outside zone. So that was my first impression, Chad. Um, I know from talking to wide receivers, I'd like to hear your perspective on maybe how some of the motions and maybe how the offensive philosophy has changed to maybe help the passing game. Yeah, really some interesting quotes, Scott. I'm glad you talked about the O-line because I noticed you were talking to – like the one guy I didn't talk to was Connor Colby. Um, yeah. So I think that was smart of you to do that. I was more focused on the receivers. So um, here's some, here's what here are some quotes that stood out to me. Okay, Caleb Brown. Uh, there are a lot of answers. That's probably the biggest thing about it. A lot of different go tos. I feel like it fits really well with our personnel. Honestly, also said a lot more shots than last year. That's for sure. Definitely receiver friendly. Um, Caden Weichen had had some good quotes as well about kind of like how they're playing to their strengths as a receiver. I think one of the things that stood out to me, at least uh, is is maybe where some of this hope is coming from, Scott, is, okay, we know Iowa was thin at receiver to start the 2022 season. Very thin. But mm -hmm. I think we both agree that they just didn't – they had athletes there. They just didn't use them. <laughs> mm -hmm. They didn't they, – they just – I don't know whether it was a refusal to use them or there was not knowing how to use them. And it seems like that is what has changed a willingness to use this receiver group. Cause you think about it, Scott, they, I mean, there are good looking, you know, players in there. We look, we see Jarrett Bowie, for example, on the field before games. And that guy looks like a division one. <laughs> he looks like a power five receiver to me, like mm -hmm. potentially a future tight end. I mean, like he's, He's a big body, and we've seen Caleb Brown. You know, we just see the athleticism he has. Caden Weechin, you know, so much mm -hmm. speed, but just never used. These are some examples, and, and it felt like to me these guys were excited that they're using that, that Lester is trying to utilize the receiver group, which, mm -hmm. is, which is different. I know, you know, we've just seen this so tight end centered. I wonder if that was a Brian Ferentz blind spot in a way because of his background you know coaching tight ends being tight end you so to speak do you think that that there's there's anything there in terms of just maybe the wide receiver group is finally getting a look well there's no question that it had been overlooked for a long time and i mean you go back to the 
to the time when they played Michigan in the Big Ten Championship a few years ago. And you have Charlie Jones and you have Tyrone Tracy and you have, you know, uh, Keegan Johnson and Arlen Bruce. And you have players that are capable of making, of taking another, and Nico was there as well. But you have players who are capable of making plays. But nothing that they did schematically put them in position to make plays based on their own abilities. It was all, this is the way we run it, and you're going to run it this way. And that's why you have Charlie Jones going from, what, 20-some-odd catches to 100-plus catches leading the country in one year after another and taking himself from being a, a, a nobody to an NFL draft pick and playing for the Cincinnati Bengals. And, and that's when you look at Tyrone Tracy, I think, is a great example of that. Um, a player that was not an X receiver, yet that's where they played him. They didn't play him in the slot. You know, he ended up becoming a running back, and he's going to get drafted next week because of that. But if he was in the slot, that that totally changes what he can do for you because he's quick, he's elusive, he's very physical. And if they would have put him there, which is where he really wanted to play all along, then they utilize him. Instead, they didn't do that. And I like that's what I like and talking to Caleb Brown. That's where he's playing. They moved TJ Washington to there. He's playing in the slot too. Caden Weijan has a lot of quickness and fat, and he was really fast. You know, he did kind of laugh when I asked him about motions and he's like, uh, there's pros and cons with being speed because you're the main guy running back and forth. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny, but, but all of the motion is helpful in multiple ways. One is running the football. It allows that offensive line to get into the second level without having to clip anybody. <laughs> second of all, it allows defense to have to watch all this movement and then go from there. I think that part is completely different. Will it be effective? Well, we're all on the wait and see mode, but I do think that there is some pluses here that, that are, uh, and the excitement you, we have to report because it's obvious. Yeah, and uh, Weechin had probably, I think, the best quote. Um, not the best, but like one of them just speaking to that, which was, you know, Lester has told them, like, this is not going to be an overnight thing. It's going to take time. So I think that's also a reminder. But it is something that is exciting to them. And uh, I know people don't want to hear anything about Deacon Hill, um, but <laughs> – did talk to him for a little while and I know you did too. And I know he stood there for a while. It was, um, mm -hmm. it was actually good to hear from him in a sense that he provided some insight into the offense as well. And, you know, one of the things that he said was uh, that they are taking being more aggressive with downfield shots. He said, we're pretty aggressive downfield. Lester likes to take some shots. Also said, we throw the ball a lot. And that uh, I tweeted that out, but I said, is that, something that Kirk Ferentz is okay with. And he said, yeah, he's spending time with the O-line. Like he always is. This is Lester's show right now, he said. So um, I thought that was interesting. And then the other little wrinkle, and I'm not sure, maybe he said this a few times, but while I was over there, he said that this offense, from what he has been told, is similar to what Paul Christ ran in 2011 when Russell Wilson was the quarterback uh, a lot, which we, you know, I finally got to go back to my Paul Chris column that never ran and pull out some <laughs> 2011 stats there you uh, go. from that team. And, you know, obviously Iowa doesn't have a Russell Wilson on the roster, but it was more of that West coast style of offense where it's efficient um, completion percentage passing, still a very, very potent running game. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we're getting that we're getting hints again, this is, this is a West Coast type of offense. Shanahan influence. I love that. I was an NFL fan. You know, there's no better influence to draw from than the Shanahan tree. So uh, I'm pretty pumped about that side of it and just the fact that it seems like at least this spring, now when push comes to shove in the fall, we know Kirk Ferentz will, you know, put on his uh, restrictor plate. But still, it seems like they're, he's letting Lester do what he wants to do right now. And I think that's encouraging. Yeah, I mean, when they and they get in the fall, it'll be Talladega, you know, <laughs> restrictor plate. No, I I do like that they're letting him go, you know. And Kirk mentioned that, you know, I think you asked about Greg Davis and in, in his press conference, and just that 
you know, we're just letting this go the way it is right now. And, and, you know, in situationally, the head coach absolutely should be involved. You know, if it's, if it's third and five, you know, and he should have input on or third and one or whatever. That that's that's one thing. But but I think now that they're using his playbook, that they're really they're not changing fundamentally up front, but they're changing all the terminology. I think that's really important to let him go, let him do what he wants to do. Because let's face it, I would had the worst yards per play of any Big Ten team since 1984. And that was the old Northwestern team. And you can argue with the number of changes in football over the last four decades that this was the worst offense in Big Ten history. I mean, it really was. Man, and, I had not heard that stat before. That was a good stat there. Yeah. And that's very, very – I'm going to have to steal that one. That's discouraging. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So, Woo, you know, and, and went from horrific to just, you know, rock bottom was really just like quicksand underneath it. And, and so – they need to have that kind of change. They need to have, you know, next level of, uh, you know, allowing somebody just to take ownership of it, do what he wants to do, and then pick and choose and curtail and, and adapt when you need to, you know, because there's going to be an injury or two. There's going to be something that doesn't work. There's going to be somebody who actually improves. They're going to have a different quarterback out there. There's going to be all kinds of different things that, that are going to happen over the next four to five months. So they're going to have to figure that out. But overall, I like the fact that they are, you know, that they're motion heavy, as you said, Shanahan offense, um, Shanahan, um, you know, you look at, you know, the Rams, you look at Detroit and what they do with a lot of pre-stamp movement and how they're able to still do what they want to do, but they do it, you know, in a way where, it's advantageous for them and why nine on the run for, you know, I don't know if there's a Todd Gurley in there, you know, for the Rams, but you know, a few years ago, but I think there might be, you know, I, I like the running backs. So I, I think there's uh, some real opportunity here. Not again, we're not going to get too, you know, effusive in our praise. And even next week we got to cur curtail ourselves a little bit, mm -hmm. but still, I think Chad, we're, we're seeing something different and different is better. That's the thing for me is it's just you've got change. It's it's real change. It's tangible change. The players are communicating that's change. They wouldn't have to say anything, but they're excited about it and they want to talk about it. You know, um, I want to say thank you to Heartland Flags and Gifts, which helps us bring you legends and listeners every week. Thank them for their sponsorship of Iowa Everywhere. Heartland Flags and Gifts has you covered with nearly every sport, every team and every flag. Visit our friends online at heartlandflags.com or better yet, in store at 3719 Southwest 9th Street in Des Moines. Maybe get a master's flag while you're over there. Um, yeah, and the, of course, Lester comes from the Packers, Scott, So and they mm -hmm. run Shanahan. You know, mm -hmm. Obviously, Matt LaFleur is on that mm -hmm. Shanahan tree as well. So, <laughs> um, And they, they did quite a bit with not that much on offense last year, honestly. So I feel like, you know, I don't know. It's something positive uh to pull from i suppose uh should we talk about john budmeyer we still haven't um you know we kind of realized we didn't ask kirk about that um in the press conference which was dominated yeah. by caden proctor and tim lester uh, yeah to open the spring and uh but now uh you know so the budmeyer thing kind of whatever slipped through snuck through Everyone says he's authentic, uh, really cool guy, uh, learning a lot. And what a lot of guys said, I think it was Bostic. Yeah, Bostic and Deacon Hill both said this, is that Bud Meyer, which is what we thought, is giving the receivers an idea of what the quarterback is thinking, what mm -hmm. the quarterback wants. And so I think that there's a strong chemistry developing between Lester and Bud Meyer which is probably the perfect scenario for Kirk Ferentz, who, you know, he liked Bud Meyer all along, but obviously the knock was, well, he was an analyst for two years and what did he, what did he do for you? The offense stunk, but they seem to really like his expertise at the quarterback position. And I mean, the receivers seem to like this fresh start as well, Scott. So I don't know. What do you, did you get any uh, vibe on John Bud Meyer as receivers coach? A little bit. I think along those lines that, um, more than worrying about or thinking about what Bud brings to that unit, because I still want to see what it does in the fall. I, I wanted to know how he taught. And to me, 
the combination seems to be him and Tim Lester together are showing routes, are working the routes. And as you said, working together with the quarterback. I think that's really the most important – pardon me. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think that's the most important element here, Chad, that um, – both sides need to know what the other side is thinking. And then when you also look at the quarterback slash uh, OC with the wide receivers coach working together, then that way they can at least figure out how they want the route run and what depth, what are you looking for to understand the nuance of the route. And then also just so that way it all comes together. That's what I was most focused on and we'll see it in action next week, of course, but you know, Caleb Brown is the one player that I'm really kind of most focused on at this point because I think he's got the most athletic potential. And he, you know, described how both of them are so heavily involved and, in, in, you know, how the routes are run. And I think that's really, a, you know, an important part of what I took away from yesterday. Yeah, Jacob Bostic, you know, referenced that as well. He's They seem excited about it. Um, he's playing the X, by the way, Bostic. Mm -hmm. So that's – I think that's a good thing. He's mm -hmm. a little taller, got that length. Yeah. He's healthy. So yeah. He's positive for the Hawkeyes. Uh, you know, there's always the questions like who's looking good or whatever, yeah. like the young guys. And, you know, we heard yeah. just about every name. So I don't know. I heard Jarrett Bowie, heard Dayton Howard. Weechin's name came up. Yeah. Uh, obviously, he's not a young guy, but he's probably your punt returner this year, too. So, uh, all this has to have a good quarterback, though, Scott. And so what do we feel about the quarterback situation? Um, open practice yesterday. It seemed like the quarterbacks were – even Cade was a little bit off the mark, a little choppy. Um, you don't know. I mean, it's just not – the position is not settled. <laughs> and they're, I think the biggest takeaway from a lot of folks that weren't there, didn't talk to players, is like, oh, well, Deacon's still number one quarterback, so we're screwed. <laughs> yeah, that that's kind of shallow thinking. I mean, at this point, because number one, Cade McNamara is the number one quarterback. That's not going to change. He's going to be number one as soon as he's healthy enough to be number one. And that probably at least he'll be able to do seven on seven and he'll be cleared to do all activities in you know training camp. So that's the one, the first thing to start thinking about. Deacon Hill, I mean, who else are they going to have? You know, are they going to move uh Jamari Harris from corner to play quarterback, you know, I mean, it's just not going to happen. Second thing is I still think that with the portal opening on Monday, that there's going to be a quarterback for Iowa and whether that's a person that challenges Cade works in as the number two. Um, that's what my anticipation is. I do think that's going to happen at some point and it's going to be somebody who's probably a combination of run passer. So I, I expect that to be the case. Um, so going into the fall, it's that's what I'm looking at. So with quarterback, I'm almost like they're just like out of sight. I'm not going to focus on these two. I want to see – I do want to see Marco because he was a guy you – know, and, and now we can kind of scrutinize this because he's in his you know, redshirt freshman year. Um, you know, what have they got in him? Is he good enough? And if he isn't, then why did you you go out and recruit this guy when you had you know JJ Cole you didn't you decided to eh, we'll, we'll let him go you know and there are other quarterbacks and you really it would it would be another you know check against you from the recruiting standpoint so I'm giving him time I'm not going to dog him but I do think that it's worthwhile to to say if he can't step up and be you know, the number one coming out of Saturday of the players on the field, then what was the recruiting quarter? What was the recruiting quarterback situation like? Well, and that was, I think one of the only things we could learn this spring about quarterback is like, do they, how do they feel about Marco line as to, you know, and if we see them aggressively pursue the portal, that's probably our answer. Yeah. And Deacon did say that he's been taking most of the one, one reps, if not all the one reps. So he, you know, Marco Linus has not jumped to that one line, you know, and, and Deacon had, you know, kind of historically low <laughs> quarterback numbers last year. So mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. But like you said, I'm not, I think the biggest thing this spring is to get the offense installed. And it seems like that's making some progress. And 
we did talk to Luke Lachey and Addison Ostringa mm-hmm. as well yesterday, two tight ends that will be instrumental to this whole deal, and they're lining up in different spots. I feel like, again, we've referenced the 49ers a lot on this show, Scott, but I like that. I like what the 49ers do with Kittle and Juszczyk and how they – Move them around. I view Lachey as maybe the Kittle and Ostrangel yeah. a little bit, you know, maybe a bigger, wider body, I guess you could say. Lachey is bigger in just about every way, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, maybe more that, you know, blocking tight end role. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see, but I like, I like the thought of that, you know. Um, so that's a, you know, it was great to hear from from Luke yesterday as well. Yeah, I, I like Luke a lot. I think he's got unlimited potential and that, and he's got, you know, it's, it's strange to say this, but he may have the most potential out of any of the tight ends that Iowa's had come through here. And that's, I don't mean that hyper, you know, and hyperbole here, you know, I mean, Laporta's great, obviously Kittle's great and Hawkinson and Fant's been really good. Um, but, you know, when you look at the body and you look at what he can do that, you know, his potential is limitless. And, and so I think, you know, as much as we talk about the passing game and wanting to get wide receivers involved, you got to get him involved. He's probably your best player on that side of the ball. So, um, and the fact that he came back, that's, that's huge because that, you know, I talked to some NFL people who were like, eh, if he would have came out, he might've been the number two tight end. He's you know, well thought of, you know, didn't have much of a season, but I think coming back, it bolsters his case that, Colston, Loveland, and him are probably neck and neck for the best tight ends in the country this year. So I, I, I'm glad that, you know, he's talked about the install and how it's affected him and, and, you know, there's more movement. And one of the things Tim Lester did a lot with at Western Michigan was kind of running them like double H backs. You know, sometimes, you know, he'd have like, you know, an X on one side, a Z on the other, maybe on the line of scrimmage, but then you have two Dex backs who could kind of move and, and, and the Lions did that a lot with Laporta, that like it, as soon as the snap went, you know, they would backside block or, you know, wham block or whatever. And I think that's something that he's done a really good job of and he's capable of doing. So I think whatever position you put him in, it, it'll be an advantage against any player. I mean, linebacker, defensive end, you know, or certainly anybody in the secondary. So um, I, I think he's, he's going to be all world this year. Yeah, definitely. I think, and I think one of the keys for him to flourish is to use the wide receivers. You mm-hmm. know, so you can't just gang up on Laporta like they did in his yeah. senior year. Um, so you have to have to be able to to spread the ball like that. And so it sounds like Lachey is still, you know, he's full fully cleared, but also they're kind of, you know, limiting his reps, understandably. So uh, I wanted. I mean, I did not go Tuesday, like I said. I know you talked to defensive players on Tuesday. Any, give me one takeaway from talking to the defensive side of the ball, which, you know, pretty much everyone is back in the back seven and then some, <laughs> but uh, what was the, what was your number one takeaway, Scott, from Tuesday's <laughs> interviews? It's such a blur, Chad, because of, of going to Cleveland and coming in. Oh yeah, I'm going to jump right into this. But I will say this, that talking to the defensive backs, that they were not happy with their limited number of interceptions last year. And so they are focusing more heavily on taking the ball away. Um, That was the one difference between last year and the last couple of years where, you know, what the 21, I think it was, they had 25 interceptions and, you know, they've really turned those into points. And last year they had the opportunity to do that, but they weren't as good as they needed to be. And the turnover margin showed it. I mean, the offense turned the ball over way, way, way too many times and the defense didn't reclaim it very often. So I think what we see out of, you know, whether it's talking to Xavier Wampa, uh, you know, or, you know, Deshaun Lee or any of those players that that was, that was really, uh, you know, important. And then, you know, among the defensive linemen, there's a confidence there, you know, they're going to, they actually are the unit on defense that lost probably the most with Logan Lee and, and Joe Evans, but then they also bring back a significant number of players and rotational players. And, and Aaron Graves, every time I see him, he just looks more and more like Mr. Incredible from the Incredibles. And uh, so I, I think, but my main takeaway is their takeaways or lack thereof last year and how they want to rectify that. Well, Scott, it is master's week in my DRF sports, book. Book pick Wyndham Scott to make the top 20 got off to a fast start. 
He shot a front nine 33 on Thursday, but he enters Friday at plus one. So I just need him to make the cut. If he can just make the cut, I feel good about him, uh, the reigning U.S. Open champ, to crack the top 20. I still feel good about it, although the odds have slipped just a bit. So I'm hanging with Wyndham Clark. How's uh, how's it going for you? Well, I uh... – let me let me think here. <laughs> I am not much on the Masters as much as other people are, which maybe makes me look like it. I right, did watch last night, it. but uh, you know, I I would say I watched this morning and was it was it Jordan Spieth who had just a dreadful yeah, he had the nine you know, on fifteen, yeah, yeah, that was just horrific to watch. And um, but you know, I, I don't know, you know, I'd like to see Rory pull up, you know, but he's way back and. I don't know. We'll see what happens, Chad. <laughs> I always like rooting for Tiger. I always like rooting for Tiger. I hope he makes the cut and makes it into the weekend. Um, before we get to women's hoops, Scott, Fran McCaffrey made some news yesterday at the PCA meeting. Uh, I'll let you share it with the folks. You tweeted it out, and people reacted. <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah, they uh... – Yesterday at the Presidential Committee on Athletics meeting, which is a monthly meeting that takes place between members of the hierarchy of the athletic staff with a hand-picked committee comprised of university presidents and other hierarchy that chosen by the president, uh, they invite a coach usually once a month who talks. And this month was Fran McCaffrey. And he talked a lot about the, the transfer portal and, you know, things he always says, you know, transfer portal and pay for play and what have you. But in this case, he mentioned uh, he brought up Tony Perkins and said that uh, his market value was $500,000 and uh, and we couldn't cover that. So he's, he's out and um, tweeting that number out generated significant reaction, overreaction in a lot of cases. But, but I think there's, there's some points to this. Now, did Fran exaggerate that number? Perhaps, you know, Fran does use superlatives and, and things that sometimes you need to tone back, but that is, that's not outlandish either for a starting point guard um, to go on the open market. And, and when he, and when you look at what Iowa is facing, you know, in NIL, it's scary when you think you cannot keep your own players because, you know, and that own player might either A, go to Indiana or B, go to Missouri who are on your border or peer institutions in this sport. Um, it, it really draws some questions about what can Iowa afford? How do you get there? How can you keep these players? And, you know, and maybe this year is one example because, you know, of course fans are poo-pooing all over Tony, but what happens if Owen Freeman's first team all Big Ten next year? You don't think that people aren't going to start tampering with him? You know, so I think uh, there's a lot of caution, a lot of worry, a lot of concern that needs to be addressed here that if Iowa can't keep its own players, if Iowa can't afford to keep its own players, then I think, you know, there needs to be this humongous conversation about how do you do this in the future? Otherwise, you're a AAA affiliate for everybody else that's at your peer, peer level. Yeah, I was just going to kind of say the same thing there. Uh, you know, you look at the Missouri Valley Conference. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I think the first three teams of their all-conference team are all in the portal or graduated, and which was like, I think, three out of the 15. Obviously, Drake had, yeah. you know, was a factor right. in that, losing their coach to West Virginia. But still, um, yeah, that's what that's what life as a Missouri Valley coach is like, and you don't want to become that in a Big Ten, you know, that's growing now to 18 teams if you're the – you know, suddenly I'm not saying I was going to get there, but if you're like in the 14th, 15th range of the big 10 and can't get out, that's what you're going to probably become. Right. I mean, <laughs> so it's a, it is a scary, it's a scary period to be in. And I also hate like saying, well, you know, the guy that, you know, sells insurance needs to donate to the swarm. I like hesitate to say that too, because, I mean, to me, this is like big money, like, yeah. you know, you know, five bucks at a time, I'm sure helps, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about big donors, just like, uh, you know, Tyson chicken down in Arkansas to get Calipari. I mean, mm -hmm. you kind of need, you need big bucks like that. I think at this stage, especially in basketball where one or two guys 
or gals um, yeah. can really make a difference. So it is a dicey period we're going into for Iowa basketball. But at the same time, I think there's a strong chance that you could see Peyton Sanford, Josh Dix, and Owen Freeman being the centerpiece of this team next year. And that's a pretty good place to start. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I know I was trying to bring some portal guys in too, and they have to, but uh, yeah. we'll see. You know, th- this is a real crossroads moment to me and for men's basketball in a lot of ways. And and some of that is, you know, how long, you know, we can talk about the Fran McCaffrey factor, you know, how long is he going to be here? Is it for the long haul? It doesn't really matter at this point he's here, but I think, uh, you know, energizing the base to help with NIL is really important, but I'm with you. I mean, it's hard to, Right now, adding NIL in the last three years has put undue pressure um, on fans to come up with money for for athletes because the institutions still want you to donate at the same level that you were before. But now they're asking you, oh, we also need you to pay for these athletes. And we're talking about significant money. This isn't 50 bucks spending money or even a a $5,000 check. We're talking about whether it's 500K, like Fran said, or if it's actually more like 300K, I mean, that's still a lot of money. And you're talking about, you know, Iowa doesn't have that sugar daddy, you know, it doesn't have that Tyson's or doesn't have, uh, you know, the guy at Oklahoma State, you know, Boone Pickens and, or even, uh, the, even the people at Iowa State, you know, there's some heavy hitters there. And, and so, and then you've also got your fans who are fans of all the sports, but what do they want to give to? Do they want to give to football? Do they want to give to basketball? You know, that's that's another animal. So, and and you run this risk again. You know, you this number is out there. I don't know if, why Fran decided to say it, but he said it. And now people will judge you. Well, you can't go there. They don't have enough money. You know, they're not going to get anybody around you. Uh, they'll use it against Iowa. And then maybe Fran's trying to do that to pressure some of the fans to say, in order for us to be any good, we're going to have to keep our own players and spend money, but that strategy doesn't always work either. So there's a lot of uh, it's existential to whether or not, I mean, you know, and here's the other part, Chad um, last six years, Fran has won 10 games, in the big 10, you know, every year in 11 out of the last 12, they've been upper division. And I know it's not sweet 16 and we can criticize them. We have criticized them heavily for that, but they've also been very competitive mm-hmm. and, and you chip this away. And they're not competitive. And an 18 team big Big Ten, it could be really tough for this fan base for a while. Well, Masters Week, uh, which I referenced, is also a good time to thank our friends at Steeple Ridge Bourbon for their support of legends and listeners. Steeple Ridge delivers a high quality, delicious drinking, award winning craft bourbon. If you don't find Steeple Ridge at your favorite retailer, ask for it by name. Steeple Ridge is distilled, aged, and bottled in Erling, Iowa by Lonely Oak Distillery. All right, Scott, we got about 10 minutes left or so. And uh, the Iowa women uh, obviously were the huge story this winter. The Caitlin Clark era ends. Uh, A team celebration has been completed. Uh, Caitlin Clark's jersey, no surprise, will be retired. Number 22. Uh, I I saw just a shred of criticism that Iowa was celebrating a national runner-up. But that's silly because it was an amazing ride. It was an amazing, unforgettable team. And uh, absolutely, um, to get to the national title game two years in a row um, is worth celebrating, whether you got the biggest trophy or not. Uh, to me, it was uh, – I mean, that would have been like the, the gravy to all this. But to do what they did and beat uh, Don Staley last year, Kim Mulkey this year, Gino Ariama this year in the tournament in highly competitive, highly tense games – with the best player in women's basketball history uh, from your own state uh, and basically not much top hundred talent around her. <laughs> it was a pretty incredible story and uh, deserves to be celebrated. You know, Chad, watching that on Friday night against, against UConn, the first quarter for me was kind of revealing. And I'm watching UConn's players, what they look like, how they perform, how they compete. And I'm looking at Iowa, and it's in some ways it would be like Alabama football competing against Iowa football. You've got athletes that are five stars, and you can see it. And then you look over here, and it's like 
highly developed three stars, except for Caitlin, of course. And I think Hannah Stolke would be a little higher than that too. But you just see an unlevel of, 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 uh, unlevel athleticism on the floor. And yet Iowa was able to overcome that. I think we saw the same thing. You probably could say more on against LSU. Certainly it was definitely the case against South Carolina and they still competed as well as they could. There's this depth and the rebounding. It was just South Carolina addressed its inefficiencies in the portal. But this team absolutely was deserving of a celebration because it's not always about them. It's about us. It's about we. It's about the fan base. How do they feel about this team? They love this team unconditionally. This is the most I, – I've never seen a fan base embrace a team like this, not Iowa's fan base. They love this team and will love it until, you know, for the next 50 years. It will be, it will go down not only as one of the greats on the floor, but the rallies and the, the just, it's like small town basketball chat. And your team goes to state and everybody knows everybody. And these are like the girls from your neighborhood. And you saw them when they were little kids and they were dribbling in the driveway and then they make a basket. That's the way people feel about this team. You know, they know my first names, Kate and Kate and Gabby and, you know, Hannah and, and Sid and, you know, Molly, Molly. Oh, yeah. Molly, of course. <laughs> Can't forget you. Molly. <laughs> yes. Molly's headband and, and the shirts that go along with them and the love and the embrace. And of course, the greatest player of all time. What's not to celebrate that they didn't win a championship and that, well, we just have this for championships. It's about the celebration. It's like it's like a birthday party. Enjoy it. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've followed Iowa athletics my whole life and, you know, they've, they've gotten further than any team. I'm not going to, I mean, wrestling is a different animal, um, yeah. but football, basketball, the two big sports, uh, got to the national title game twice, back to back years. I don't know if I'll ever see, I mean, I'm 50 years old. I don't know if I'll ever see an Iowa football or basketball team get to a national title game in the rest of my life. I really, I mean. And I think people realize that too. I think most people realize this is not common yeah. for Iowa. This is not, I mean, just as Caitlin Clark said, like getting to the final four once was pretty incredible or pretty like awesome, but like getting there twice is incredible. And they not only got to the final four both years, but they beat programmed, you know, juggernauts in the mm -hmm. national semifinals on the biggest stage with clutch late game moments you know, in those games. And this year, especially, it wasn't, it wasn't really Caitlin. I mean, she was obviously the best player on the floor against UConn, but other players stepped up. Hannah Stulke had an incredible game uh, in mm -hmm. the post 23 points. Kate Martin with clutch, you know, spin moves and fadeaways in that fourth quarter when Iowa needed buckets. Gabby Marshall draws the foul, legitimate foul, a real mm -hmm. foul, four ways it was a moving screen foul yeah. uh, to clinch the win and also played outstanding defense on Paige Beckers. And, and Sydney Fulter, I mean, they probably crashed to the floor like 45 yeah. times in that game and, <laughs> and, and made some big plays yeah. and, and, you know, played her guts out. So uh, all those reasons to me makes this – that much more memorable because again you didn't assemble some super team this was a one super player and a true team that found their way to the promised land twice it just couldn't get, and you could see it in both national title games you just couldn't get over the hump of of star power and it's just it was just too much both years but looking back like last year was probably the better shot when yeah. you saw that south carolina team up close like it was it was uh, pretty impressive what they did to even hang with South Carolina, honestly. Yeah, I'm there with you. I think last year, you know, it from what Jan said, Jan Jensen said in the locker room, really stuck with me. And I, you could tell that last year was more of a frustration, that they are frustrated by the way the game was officiated. They are frustrated by um, big players making – or players making big plays for LSU that they didn't expect. Um, so the style of game just kind of went out the window for them. This year was a Herculean task. I mean, you watch South Carolina, and they they did not have a weakness. They were undefeated for a reason, just like they were last year, except they're a better team this year because they have shooters. And Iowa, to their credit, really started strong. I mean, they were hitting everything from the perimeter, and it was like, oh, wow. If they, but you also know that that can't 
keep up. You can keep up getting getting the basket. You can't keep up, you know, hitting eighty percent from three point range or anything. So, uh, but the fact that they kept chipping away, kept fighting, they would be down and then they would claw back within six or five, and it's just, I mean, it says a lot about them. And, and as you said about Gabby Marshall, her, uh, you know, being able to to get that foul. You know, this is the 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 discussion I wanted to hear on Sports Center after the fact, and I didn't watch it. Obviously, I was working, but I did watch it later the next day. And what I think would have been better instead of this, it sucked. You can't call that play at that time of game, and then have uh, a bunch of UConn players commenting about it too. Would have been why didn't Paige Beckers cut the cut the screen closer? Why didn't she get closer to Aaliyah Edwards? Which means that this the the screener can then hit the player without moving. Instead, she took it so wide that they get, there was room for Gabby Marshall to move, which meant Aaliyah Edwards had to move her feet, you know, and then of course she'd look like, you know, somebody getting ready to shoot a bow and arrow, you know, with wide base and wide yeah, lanes. Yeah, someone on Twitter pointed out like a left tackle, like getting out yeah. of like, you know, right. like, you know, block the exactly. edge rusher. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So you know, instead it's like, oh, we didn't, you know, you got robbed of a last second shot. No, you can't just because there's 10, 8, 6 seconds left. You can't just swallow your whistle on a play like that. You can on loose ball fouls, but you can't on something like that. Yeah, 3.9 seconds left, actually. And, you know, there's no – Hannah Stolke was right there. So even if Paige mm-hmm. gets the ball, like time's going to be running out quick. Uh, they got to make a shot. Um, so <laughs> it's not like – yeah, there were a lot of things would have had to go right in addition to them not blowing the whistle for UConn to actually get that win. So obviously a much deserved Iowa win. Let's talk a little bit about Monday night, Scott. Uh, neither one of us is a WNBA expert. Let's just put that out there now. But uh, the Caitlin Clark impact on the WNBA is going to be fascinating to watch. I think uh, we've seen 36 of the 40 fever games will be nationally broadcast. And I put that in air quotes. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta still hunt to find it, but yeah. uh, it's a, they'll be available. Um, you know, networks like NBA TV, Amazon prime, those kinds of things. Uh, Ion, which I'm going to have to find, but I know I have on YouTube TV. Yeah. Um, but uh, after having one last year, one fever game was out of 40 was on. Yeah. So uh, my prediction well, what's your prediction for the Caitlin Clark impact, Scott? Um, it doesn't have to be a bold prediction, but just what you know about her and what do you expect? That ratings for the WNBA as a whole, and of course when she's playing, will be the highest on record. I think, you know, and I don't know if I'm stepping out too much on a limb here or if I'm hugging the, the tree, but I do think that where we're it's it's at a zenith in popularity the sport is. We <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is look at the TV ratings for the, the women's basketball championship game outdrew the men by more than 4 million viewers. And I expect similar type results on Monday. It'll probably be the most viewed WNBA draft of all time. It'll be the most viewed season of all time. And I'm, but I'm mostly anxious to see, Chad, what, what will the reception be like? Mm-hmm. from players from other players i was not at all i thought it was uh, you know defeated the purpose you know when you see first of all uh, a network based in connecticut that has um you know their lead analyst for the game is played at uconn another channel full of players who played at uconn and does not have a big 10 contract and then we're, we're basically arguing against Caitlin Clark, her impact, what it's going to be. I I think that they need, they needed some balance and I'll be anxious to see what the other players, how they treat her because she's the golden goose, man. And you better, you better hop on that, those wings. Otherwise you're going to kill it. Yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, the TV rating is unbelievable. I mean, the, the three most watched games and, uh, women's basketball history were the last three of Caitlin's yeah. career <laughs> in succession. Yeah. Uh, if I remember right, 12.3, 14.4, 18.9, something. Yeah. So um, my prediction is, and I've said this elsewhere, So, but repeat it here, that she's going to be uh, 
more impactful as a passer in the early going. She's a super smart, high IQ player, but she's going to a league with a lot of great players. Yeah. Uh, but number one, she can lean on her passing. The passing is elite, probably the most uh, electric part of her game outside the logo shots is her passing. And now she has going to have four teammates that can finish those, those passes. So I think her assist numbers will be higher than her, than maybe the, the points we saw in college um, early on. And I think that's what she'll want to do because she is a good teammate. She is, I think that will, whatever perception Indiana Fever players have now, I think their perception will probably be changed about Caitlin because she's a great teammate, a great passer, and she's intense and she's going to want to make them all better. And she's going to work her butt off uh, to be to be the best. And so uh, I'm really excited to keep watching her and I'm going to keep watching her uh, because it's it's fun. And, uh, you know, it's fun to get to to watch somebody that we saw up close a long time ago in uh, with cardboard cutouts and even before that sure. at Dowling Catholic, but um, to see how her career has risen and uh, just the impact that, that she has. And I think, so I think that's where it's going to be. And I think she is going to be great eventually, but I think she's also going to get some, a lot of hate and mm-hmm. a lot of hate from just about, I mean, I don't want to say it, probably 50% of, women's basketball fans out there because that's just the way it it goes. And it's nothing that she's brought on herself. None of it. Mm-hmm. None of it yeah. is brought on by her. It's all brought on by other factors because she handles everything beautifully. And you can say what you want about her pleading with the refs. That's fine. But that's not where this is coming from. It's coming from they don't want to see her succeed, it's whoever it is. That someone thinks she's overrated or whatever. But so the, she's going to have to deal with that, I think. But I think eventually more and more people will realize what we saw, Scott, for four years is that she's a magnetic, per, magnetic personality and just unbelievable for the whole game of basketball. Mm-hmm. Well said. She's There's going to be points where she's going to get hit hard. Um, it's coming from a place of jealousy and it's really unfortunate because all she's done is take women's basketball to the places that they want it to go. And then she's become such an icon to so many people that the other side, people have to tear her down, whether it's the past generation of players versus the current ones who don't like a lot of, about her, but she has brought women's basketball from, being, you know, a, a minor sport, you know, in this country to the forefront. And it's really unfortunate that some people are u- choosing to use their platform to try to tear her down because if they tear her down, if they hurt her, if they make her, uh, if they do whatever it takes just to make sure she doesn't succeed, they're not going to succeed. The fans that have followed her, it, You know, a lot of them follow Iowa, of course, but a lot of them nationally that follow her will not follow the WNBA if Caitlin Clark gets hit to the point where she can't compete. And so they do have to be cognizant of that, that a rising tide lifts all boats. That's financially. That's with stature. And, uh, you know, it'll be, you know, Iowa is going to have two first round picks next week. You know, we also have Cooper DeGene, who we haven't mentioned had a, an, an electrifying performance in his pro day and was probably a little disappointed with the way he ran, even though uh, he's still doing that only 12 days after being cleared to be able to run. So uh, I had to segue that in there, but yeah, good call. Uh, you yeah, know, there's, like there's two, uh, two electrifying all-time greats at, from the university of Iowa who will be first round draft picks and command a lot of attention and spotlight next week. Yeah, well, whole, the draft, I believe, is two weekends away, but still, we're in the same window, right? Yeah, that's true. But still. <laughs> we got the spring game. Like ten, that. Yeah, yeah. It's like 10 days apart. But anyway, yeah. so next week, thank you, Scott. Uh, next week, the Iowa spring game. So Scott Docterman and I will preview that on next week's episode of Legends and Listeners. Thank you for joining us in the Channel Seed studios and talk to you next week here on the Iowa Everywhere Network.